we stand together this morning? Why don't we do something? Why don't we enter into his presence by just magnifying his name again? Come on, can you lift your voice? Would you clap your hands before him? Amen. It's good to be in church together. It's good to be home. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. They're going to sing this morning. They're going to come and sing, thank God for the blood. Are you thankful for that this morning? Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Amen. Let's worship together with them. Thank God for the blood. Hallelujah. To wash our sins away. Thank you. good God. Look at your neighbor and ask him, has he been good to you? And if they didn't answer yes, say, well, just wait a minute. That'll change because he's a good God. Welcome to our guests this morning. I'd like to welcome our saints too. 
It's an honor to stand before you. I want to thank Pastor Shepard for giving me this opportunity. I do not take it lightly. I talk for a living, y'all. That's what I do. 30 weeks out of the year, I stand up and talk in front of people. I should be comfortable with it, but these 30 minutes on a Sunday morning just carry a whole different level of emotions and expectations because the weight of eternity lies heavy on this spot. And I don't take it lightly. I want to thank y'all for going on this journey with me. Today we're going to be wrapping up our series entitled Putting Others First. And I don't know about you, but this has been a time of reflection and challenge and growth for me personally as I have prepared these lessons. Uh, and this week was no exception. As I held myself up to the Word of God, I recognize that I have ample room for improvement and growth if I want to fulfill God's will for my life. And I want to give you a short recap of the first two lessons um, to make sure that we put this one in context. But let's read our scripture text so you can be seated and get comfortable. I don't want y'all to take me out and pea gravel me for keeping you standing too long. So let's look at Matthew 20, 25 through 28. Really, I think if we were in one mind and one accord, I could read these two scriptures together and that would be the sermon. Matthew 20, 25 through 28. But Jesus called unto him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. You're not going to be like them. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Let's turn to Philippians 2 and 5. Philippians 2 and 5 simply says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Can we pray? Lord, Lord, we come before you today with open minds and open hearts, God. I ask you to reach down into this building, Lord. Reshape us. Re-energize us, Lord. Give us a desire and a passion for this community, God. Lord, teach us to go and to love like you, to take this message outside of these four walls. Lord, to take the gospel to the world, Lord, to demonstrate it through our actions, Lord. Don't let us walk out of this building the same way we came in today, God. Challenge us. Change us, Lord. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. So our series is called Putting Others First. This is a fundamental principle of the Christian faith, so much so that it's almost become a byline, a slogan, especially here in the Bible Belt. Servant leadership. You've heard that term before, servant leadership. My university lists servant leadership as one of its six core values. They have a servant leadership program. And this idea is so fundamentally tied to the Christian faith that on the first day of their program, when they're introducing it, they are explicit and boldly say that their program is not a religious program. Because in the South, in the Bible Belt, when you say servant leadership, we automatically think of Jesus. The problem is, is that we've become so familiar with this idea that we are comfortable with it. That it's almost become a slogan on a t-shirt and not an actual way of life for many of us. So I think it's important that we take a step back. That we hit the reset button, if you will. And we take a fresh look at why servant leadership is so important. In week one of this lesson, we were reminded that we are commanded to love others. Without qualifiers. Just simply love thy neighbor. We are the body of Christ, and we have to show forth Christ's love. We are his hands and his feet, his manifestation of love on this earth. And we are instructed to love others as God loves them. What an amazing challenge to us. 
a reminder that his love is greater than our love. His love is so much greater than our love. That while we were yet sinners, while we were still wallowing in our filth, he died for us. We would have a hard time dying for a good man, but while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. And that's the kind of love we are supposed to take out and demonstrate. In week two, we examine the difference between love and kindness. And I did my best to explain that I am not discounting kindness. We absolutely must demonstrate kindness, but that is not where we stop. We have to move beyond kindness and show love for our neighbors. That lesson may have taken an unexpected turn for many of us because then we found ourselves talking about holiness. And then we examine how love allows us to dwell in the presence of a holy God. It is God's love that provided an avenue, a path for us to dwell in that all-consuming fire of a holy God. Unfortunately, the idea of love has been weaponized by our modern American society. A lot of symbols of church and love now have been taken and manipulated to represent things that do not represent God. And while we are instructed to love regardless of where we find people, in week two we learned that we, the church, the blood bought, the redeemed, cannot use love as an excuse to accept sin in our own lives. And this is simply because unrepented sin will separate us from God. And if we are separated from God, we cannot love others effectively. We will not be able to love as God loves. And I hope those two lessons have laid a suitable foundation for today's lesson. Because what we're going to discuss today does not preclude love. It does not preclude holiness but rather it is an expression of both. Today we are going to talk about love in action or serving to lead. Serving to lead. I want to be great, don't you? We want to be great. Everybody wants to be great. It's a natural human emotion. We live in the age of the influencer. We see them, we hear them on a daily basis, whether we want to or not. They are competing and vying for our attention. They are turning likes and views into cash via sponsorships and advertisement deals. Influencers peddle everything from trendy drinks to conspiracy theories. And as a society, we like to speak of equality and equity. However, when it's just us in our free time, we give our time and our money to those shameless purveyors of self-promotion. The average American now spends two hours and 27 minutes a day engaging with social media. Coincidentally, that is a little over 10% of your time every day listening to these self-promoting influencers. Their streams and posts are filled with tips on how to get rich or to gain clout. People are willing to sell you the secrets of their success for for only four payments of $24.99. Results may vary. There are countless sites that will sell you a course on how to build your self-esteem. Even the Mayo Clinic offers a course on how to battle low self-esteem. And the issue is is that the people, because we're still people of the church, are also susceptible to this. We compare preachers. We select our favorites based on their delivery styles. We rank the conferences that we attend. That's a good conference, but you don't want to go to that conference. And many of us know at least one young man that wants to be a preacher for all the wrong reasons. It's a basic human desire. We want to be great. We want to be remembered. Even the disciples themselves were not immune. Let's look at Mark chapter 9, verses 33 and 34, speaking of Jesus here. And it says, and he, Jesus, came to Capernaum. And being in the house, he asked them, his disciples, what, it was, what was it that you disputed among yourselves by the way? In plain English, he's asking them, what were you guys arguing about? They had a dispute. And listen to this. 
But they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed or argued among themselves on who should be the greatest. Even the disciples who were walking with Jesus were getting in an argument over who was the greatest. And if they can fall prey to that, we can too. And Jesus comes to them, and it's clear that they were having an argument. And Jesus asked them, what are you guys arguing about? And they got real quiet. The scripture says they held their peace. That's just another way that they kept their mouth shut. If you ever want to know if you're being petty, if you ever want to know if you've got a reason to be upset, just go talk to Jesus about it. When you go and you kneel down before the creator of the heavens and the earth and you begin to verbalize what's going on in your life, sometimes it's just going to click that, you know what, maybe this just ain't so important. I'm not being facetious. It says that he cares about the things that you care about. If it's bothering you, take it to Jesus. But also be prepared for him to say, let it go. <laughs> For him to convict you and be like, you know what, that's a minor thing. So Jesus was essentially saying, what's going on, boys? And nobody wants to confess that they're sitting there arguing about who's going to be the greatest. Can you imagine the conviction that was in their hearts at that moment? When they were on Jesus, was like, what are you guys arguing about? And you're like, Oof. You ever, you, we remember being a kid and you were doing something wrong and mom and dad walked in the room and you just knew you were caught? And I imagine the tension in that room was so thick you could cut it with a knife. They were just waiting for Jesus to rebuke them. However, he simply goes to a chair and sits down and picks up a little kid. Let's look at verse 37. This is what he says. So he picks up a little kid and puts it in his lap. He just found out the disciples are arguing about who's going to be the greatest. And he walks over and sits down and picks up a kid. And he says, whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me receiveth not me, but him that sent me. And I'm going to be honest, folks, on his service, that doesn't make a lot of sense. What does a child have to do with being the greatest disciple? Now, if you read a lot of commentaries and stuff, they will tell you that Jesus was demonstrating that we should come to him as a child and that we need to be innocent and open-minded. And I don't agree with, I mean, I don't disagree with any of that. But to me, that's not the explanation of what Jesus was doing here because that's not answering the question. It's not answering the question the disciples were asking, which is, which one of us is going to be great? In the carnal mind, what possible reason would Jesus have told them to receive a child for? They can't promote us. A child cannot go on their Instagram or their audience. Who are they going to influence? They're not going to go out and tell their 15,000 followers on TikTok that, hey, you need to vote for John to be the greatest disciple. Because although he's a fisherman, he's got this side gig where he's out doing this religious thing, and he's pretty good at it. Give him a like. Follow him. Donate to his GoFundMe because he needs a new pair of the black and gold sandals. Right? Help him upgrade his outfit a little bit. A, can't, a kid can't do that. So why would Jesus say that if you want to be great, accept the child? child can't donate to your campaign. A child can't elevate your status. Yet Jesus was essentially telling them, if you want to be great in my eyes, you have to receive those that can do absolutely nothing for you. You have to receive those that are going to be able to do absolutely nothing for you. They're not going to increase your status. They're not going to be able to contribute to your bank account. And the world does not think that way. We want sponsors and we want donors and we want prestige. But Jesus says, unless you receive the child, you can't be great. And isn't that what he did for us? He accepted us when we could offer him nothing. God doesn't need me. God does not need me. He says, if I stop praising and worshiping, the rocks will cry out. There's nothing I can do that's going to diminish God. 
I'm not going to make him any better. I'm not holding him up, so I'm not going to be able to let him down. If I stop, something else will easily take my place, but yet he died for me. He's saying, don't get it twisted. You're not going to be great in the eyes of eternity if you're looking to be great in the temporary. We have a skewed view of what greatness really is. And he is trying to refocus them and saying, you're talking about being great here. You want to be remembered on earth, but I'm trying to encourage you to take a view of eternity. And if you accept those that can do nothing for you, you may not be building clout here. But I'm watching it from heaven. Not only can a child not promote you in the eyes of the world, but it's hard work receiving a child. And all the teachers in the house just said amen. Are there any teachers in the house? It is hard work receiving a child. I could not imagine going in and receiving 25 of them on a daily basis. Miss me with that. I taught one semester of eighth grade earth science, y'all. And I was like, "Mm mm-mm, I didn't even finish that degree. I lacked one class to be a certified high school teacher. One class. And I was like, nope, it ain't even worth my investment. I ain't doing it. Mm -mm, No, sir. I'll graduate with my one degree and move on and be happy with my life. Bless you, teachers. Because not only does accepting and receiving those that can do nothing for you not give you anything, but it costs you something to. Think about it. It costs you something. Remember last week we said kindness costs something. But Jesus says if you want to be great, you must receive those that can't do anything for you. Jesus says if you receive a child in his name, you receive him. And that's because Jesus loves the others. He cares for the ones that can't give back. He wants us to love as he loves. That means loving the ones that can't do anything for us. We all want the rich man in the church, but Jesus said the poor have the gospel preached to them. Self-promotion. We want to be great, and the world tells us the way to be great is to promote ourselves. Now, I want you to notice Jesus didn't say anything bad about the desire to be great he even told them there is a way to be great he just told them make sure you're trying to be great in the right dimension your desire to be great is something that's given to you by God you should try to do your best you should try to excel just make sure that you're putting your attention and your focus and the accolades that you're seeking after are eternal accolades and not temporary ones. Jesus didn't say there was anything wrong with wanting to be great, but just make sure it's eternal greatness, not temporary greatness. The rise in social media has coincided with a surge in self-promotion, but it's nothing new. Long before social media, back in the dark ages when I was a teenager, as a young man, I had a desire for a pulpit ministry before I had some serious conversations with God and went a different route, I was pretty sure that I was going to be a preacher and I was going to evangelize or pastor or I was going to be in a pulpit on Sunday somewhere. And so I lived in Louisiana, Mississippi at that age. And if you know anything about it, there's a oneness apostolic Pentecostal church just about on every corner over there. We call it the Baskin Robbins of Pentecost. You can have any flavor you want. And so there were a lot of other young men that also wanted to be preachers, and we ran in the same circles. And when we decided that's what we wanted to do, we got the suits, and we got the shoes, and we got the haircuts, and we started going. We would go to the youth rallies, and we would go to the fellowship meetings, and we would go to the conferences. And a lot of those guys would go and sit on the front, and boy, could they worship. Unfortunately, the worship wasn't so much trying to get God's attention as it was trying to get some preacher's attention to invite them to come preach at their church. I'm telling you, I I grew up with these guys. And we would hang around after church and some of them would get over close to where the preacher was at the conference and they would try to eavesdrop to see what restaurant they were going to. Because that's the restaurant they wanted to go to. Because they wanted to say they went out to eat with the preacher. 
and they would name drop me. I had at one time I had dinner with Anthony Mangan. And what they wouldn't tell you is that they were at the same restaurant, but they were 10 tables over, and they had just enough money for a glass of water and the free rolls. But they ate with Anthony Mangan. And they were promoting themselves and wanting to get noticed. And sometimes it worked. Because if there was a pastor there that was like-minded, that liked the attention of having the young men around them. It built up their ego, and boy, howdy, did they have a good time. He's a preacher, a pastor, and he's got all these young men in his church preaching for him, and those young men are getting an opportunity to stand up and strut around like peacocks. And everything went along really swell until the water got hot. And then it was time to find greener pastures, a new church with maybe a few more pretty young ladies in it. The Bible says that that is the exact wrong way to be promoted. Let me show you. Jesus was visiting the house of the Pharisees, the chief Pharisee on the Sabbath. Now this was an all day affair. And it meant staying over because of travel restrictions. And so there were a lot of people here and they were taking rooms in the house. And Jesus Jesus noticed that some of the people there were claiming the best rooms for themselves. I'm somebody, so I should get the best room in the house. They felt entitled. But Jesus stands up and tells a parable. Let's look at Luke 14, 7 through 11. And he, Jesus, put forth a parable to those which were bidden when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. Essentially, Jesus was saying that when you come in, don't go sit in the prime spot, the head of the table, because you think you deserve it. Because inevitably, somebody's going to come in that the world sees just a little bit better, and they're going to ask you to get up and move. And then what you were taking for honor becomes your shame. But he doesn't stop there. He actually gives instructions. He says, but when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room. Go sit in the back. And when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee. He didn't say he was going to. He just said, he may see you and then say, friend, go up higher. Thou shalt have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. He might come along and notice you, see you sitting in the back in your humility and say, you know what? Your station is just a little bit above this. Why don't you go up? If you humble yourself, God will promote you. Listen, verse 11, for whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Folks, that's a promise in God's word. If you live by this, you can prove God by this. Come talk to me sometime. I have lived it, and I can give you example after example of this in my own life. If you don't take anything else today, take this. Self-promotion is self sabotage self-promotion is self-sabotage I'm going to need you to hear me right now some of you are sitting here and you are frustrated you are frustrated with your current position you are frustrated with your current status you are doing all the things the world has told you to do to get the promotion to get the recognition and it is not happening and you're becoming disgruntled and you're becoming bitter let me just tell you stop listening to the world Because what they're telling you to do is not going to work. They're telling you to promote yourself. They're telling you to get into the face of the person that's over you so you can be promoted. But the Bible says that whoever exalteth himself is going to be abased. If you're promoting yourself, you are actively sabotaging yourself in the eyes of God. Stop listening to the world. Do the best you can with why you have, where you are, and let God take care of the rest. He that humble himself shall be exalted. In contrast to those flashy young guys, there were a few of them that came to church early and hit the prayer rooms. And they stayed late afterwards and they were praying 
the, the, the toes of their shoes were messed up because they spent so much time on their knees praying. They actually came to the church work day and worked. There's a novel idea. And wouldn't you know it, the men of God in their lives noticed and their ministries flourished. Some of them are pastoring today not because they promoted themselves, but because God promoted them. There's going to be a lot of ministers. I'm not talking about preachers here. I'm talking about ministers. There's going to be a lot of ministers in Heaven's Hall of Fame that you've never heard of. There's going to be a lot of teachers, a lot of Bible studies, a lot of ushers, a lot of small group leaders that are written in the Hall of Fame of Heaven that have never preached a general conference. They've never hosted a podcast. You've never seen their tapes or heard their CDs. You've never read their books. We don't talk about them over dinner. But Jesus is writing it down in Heaven. And He says, these are the heroes. Teacher, keep teaching. Usher, keep serving. If you're teaching a Bible study, keep teaching a Bible study, because let me tell you, if he knows every hair on your head, best you believe he knows what you are doing for his kingdom. We are not competing for laurels over here. We are competing for a crown over there. Oh, we are not competing for recognition here, but we're competing for a crown over there. Serve to lead. Like I said, I don't think I found a place where God says, you shouldn't want to be great. He simply reminds us to make sure we're pursuing true greatness, not temporary fame and accolades. In our scripture text, he even tells us how to be great in his kingdom. We read down, it says, but it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you. I'm reiterating this because it's okay to want and desire greatness. Jesus is saying that's okay. Your desire to be the best you can be is okay. Just make sure you're doing it in the right way. He says if you want to be great, let him be your minister. And he can't be any more blunt than he is right here. When he says whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. It doesn't get any more plain than that. Don't seek out a position. Don't seek out a title. Become a servant and a minister. The problem is is that in the American culture, we have hijacked the second part of this passage where it says Jesus came not to be ministered unto but to minister. We love that. Yes, we do. That's right. Sign me up, baby. Sign me up. I'm going to be in the ministry. You give me a title, give me a Bible to thump in a pulpit to pound just like Jesus. No. No. He washed the feet of the disciples. He went through the wrong side of town just to speak to the adulterer. He was not standing behind a pulpit declaring that he was the king. Instead, he was ministering and we have got it twisted in our american culture we want to see ministry just as what i am doing right now but this is just the smallest part of it in this context the word minister is a lot closer to a servant than it is to a preacher now if you're gonna if you'll allow me i'm just gonna skip over that whole part of the conversation about cleaning the toilets in the church we've all heard it and i think it's absolutely necessary But I want to go even beyond that. I want to even broaden our horizons beyond that. Because service is not just for the four walls of the church. Love in action. Oh, here we go. Love in action. In many ways, American Christian culture has diminished the impact of ministry. We have reduced this vibrant thing down to one dimension. We have relegated it to a church house, and we've left it to the five-fold ministry. Well, at least three of them. We still do preachers, and we do uh, teachers, but even evangelists are seeing a diminished role. We've pulled the church inside of our four walls. We've replaced the words go in the Great Commission with they will come. Yeah, we want them to come to church. 
but we need to go to them. By and large, we as the American Christian community have abdicated our social responsibilities to the government. Listen to what I'm saying. While I am thankful for our American social welfare system, I at times have taken advantage of that. They cannot replace the ministry of Holy Ghost filled men and women of God serving and demonstrating agape love in our communities. Now, this is where God's been dealing with me personally. So if you'll just let me preach to myself for a minute and y'all just listen through the door at what's going on, all right? We know that God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And we know that it's the foolishness of preaching that saves them that believe. Notice the preaching is for the believer. And we know that we must be spiritually minded. And we know we must be holy as he is holy. But none of that exempts us from ministering to the physical needs of the men and women in our community. In fact, it is the exact opposite. If we are going to demonstrate our love for others, if we are going to serve God, we must serve others. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus is teaching, and he gives one of the most straightforward examples of what ministry really looks like. Verse 34, the king shall say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then the righteous shall answer him, saying, Lord, when have we hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? And when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? They are confused. Lord, when did we do that to you? You're the king of kings. When were you hungry or thirsty or sick or in jail? And Jesus says, the king shall answer and say to them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. You literally cannot serve Jesus without serving others. I I got to hurry up here. I got two minutes. I'm a man of faith, I teach Sunday school, I read my Bible, I wear my suits, I teach my kids how to act in church, but when I go home, I just build my own little kingdom, and Jesus is literally telling us to go out and to minister to someone. Let's all stand. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. But to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And then our second scripture text. Let this mind. What mind is he talking about? The mind that says, I need to minister. I need to give my life. Let that mind, which was also in Christ Jesus, be in you. Oh, Jesus, help me. Like I said, y'all just listening through the door. I'm preaching to myself today. But I need God to shake up my tiny, limited vision of what ministry is. Help me to see things as he sees them. Not inside of these four walls, but out there in the community, serving and ministering to others. This is the final week of this series. In week one, I challenge you to find someone to love. In week two, I challenge you to examine your heart and remove anything that might prevent you from loving as God loves. This week, I've issued the final challenge of this series. Go put your love into action. Volunteer at a food bank. Visit someone in jail. Visit a widow. Buy a stranger some food. Pay a bill for someone. Take someone some groceries. I know these are physical things. But Jesus said if you do it to them, you're doing it to him. If you serve them, you are serving 
him. It's uncomfortable. Our flesh is going to kick up a fuss. Your carnal mind is going to say this is pointless. But tell your carnal mind and your flesh it ain't about you. I'm trying to build up my greatness in heaven. And if we get a hold of this church, this building will not contain the revival. We must put others first. Let us pray. Lord, reach down and touch us today. Ignite a fire in our hearts, Lord, that we go into this community and demonstrate your love and your holiness through serving others, God. Minister to us, Lord, and help us to minister to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This time we're going to go before the Lord in prayer. How many of you believe that prayer really changes things? Prayer really has an effect. It really does do something. We're going to go before the Lord in prayer. We need to remember Brother James Smith. He is feeling sick this morning. Also, uh, Brother Thomas Schleter. He's got a disc bulging um, in his lower back. It's causing some numbness in his leg and toes. and It's putting them also on fire. He's feeling some pain. Also, Sister Bowie is feeling under the weather this morning. We want to keep her in our prayers. Also want to remember the Aldridge family. They're dealing with the loss of a precious lady in their lives. So we want to come together and pray that God would comfort them. Also, Mrs. Randall just had two stents put in and now is having gallbladder surgery. So we want to pray for her. Uh, also, Rex Ellis just had open heart surgery. We want to be with, with him. I can't imagine having open heart surgery. Amen. The Bible says in James chapter 5 and verse 13, it's a, a letter written to the church. And James said, is any among you afflicted? That word afflicted means suffering, going through a, a hardship, dealing with some sort of, of trouble. Can we stand together? We're going to pray for these in just a moment. He said, let him pray. That's the answer to it. He said, is any merry? Let him sing psalms. It's good to have people that have joy in the moment and people that are going through a trial. We can lift each other up. Amen. He says, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And here's the response. In the prayer of faith, it's going to save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. There's a response and an answer in these verses for whatever condition you find yourself in this morning. Amen. Some of us here are here this morning feeling well, lifting one another up. The Bible tells us we're to bear one another's burdens. It's good to have a family. It's good to come together corporately and be able to minister to one another. So this morning... I would if you would just lift your hands together. We're going to petition heaven together. We're going to pray in the name of Jesus. Lord, we love you so much. God, we're grateful. Everything that you've done. We thank you for the highs and the lows in our lives, God, that are teaching us something. We pray this morning for Brother Smith that you would touch his body right now. For Brother Thomas Schleter, for Sister Bowie, Lord, that healing virtue would flow through their bodies from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. And she would minister right now as the church binds together in prayer. We believe that you're ministering right now. You're reaching to, to Miss Randall and Rex Ellis right now. By faith, we bring them before you for the Aldrich family dealing with a, a loss, Lord God, of a precious woman in their life. We pray that you would speak peace into each one of them. We pray that you would have your way in this service. Lord, we love you so much. We're appreciative of all that you're doing in our midst. Lord, we give you great, great glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Has God been good to you this week? Amen. Have you been magnifying the Lord? <laughs> Amen. We're going to ask our ushers to come in just a minute. Uh, but I wanted to share something that the Lord had dropped in my spirit this morning. And it comes from Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 26 through 29. And we find the parable of the sower of the scatters the seed in expectation of a harvest. And the concept of farming is to cultivate the ground. It's to plant the seed and receive the increase of what you planted. The farmer understood that he needs to plant the seed in order to produce a return. And when the farmer plants the seed, he's partnering with the Lord himself. Now, how 
how the seed grows is a mystery to the sower and to the giver. It grows by a means that you and I cannot see, but it happens. Us, like the farmer, you have to have faith in the process in order to see the results. But I want to encourage you this morning that it truly has been tried and tested. If you plant seed, something is going to sprout. Man does what he can do when he plants the seed and possibly of giving. And God does what only God can do. And he causes the seed to grow and bring an increase. And all I can say this morning is the secret of giving an increase is in whatever seed you plant. It is having faith in the process, and it works every time. And my case point is this. Just recently, God spoke to my heart to give someone some money, and he told me specifically to give them $50, and I did. But true to God's nature in his word, just a few hours later, God mysteriously and miraculously gave me back everything I gave to them with a 10% increase. What I'm saying this morning is this. I have faith in the process, and I believe what God's Word says, that if you give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall man give unto your bosom. It works. How many of you will stand with me this morning? Believe the process and give to God. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much, God, for the resources you have in heaven. And you are ready to pour us out a blessing that none of us can contain. We thank you for the word which guides us and instructs us all along life's path. And we ask that, Lord God, you would bless each and every one that is in here today. Lord, you see the heart and you know the intent. Lord, it can be a dollar, but just like the widow with the two mites, she gave all she had in honor of you. And I pray that you would honor each and every one. In your mighty name we pray this morning. Amen and amen. Can we give them a hand clap of praise?
yet to come. Yeah. Hallelujah. I heard a preacher preach about it one time. He said, I read the back of the book, and we win. Yes. Glory. Glory to God. Welcome to our annual vision service. <laughs> uh, I was talking to somebody earlier, and they said, <clears throat> maybe it'd be a good idea if we didn't announce some of these special services we have. And folks would just show up. Uh, well, I hope folks don't pick and choose which services to attend. <clears throat> uh, but I will tell you this. This service over the years has produced some great blessing and benefit to the church family. <clears throat> Hallelujah. We're going to hear a couple of testimonies here in just a little bit that will uh, verify that statement. <clears throat> if what you've heard from me over the past, what, 37 years is not enough, then uh, there are going to be some other folks that will testify. And they're going to tell you the same thing. God is faithful to the faithful. Well, he hadn't been faithful to me. Well, if you've been faithful to him, because God is faithful to the faithful. Hallelujah. Uh, <clears throat> the day of day is the day, of course, that we promote the Church of Columbus. Now, in January... We pledge to uh, support folks outside the church. We, uh, as most of you know, we give to foreign missions and home missions. Matter of fact, we support over 200 uh, foreign and home missionaries. We support the orphanage, Tupelo Children's Mansion. We support Boys Ranch, <clears throat> the House of Mercy, House of Hope, the Valley Rescue Mission that most of you are familiar with, and of course, Teen Challenge. <clears throat> and last year, uh, we supported these institutions uh, with over $100,000. I think it came to almost $110,000 that we gave outside these walls. <clears throat> uh, but today, this is for us. Why is that? Why is that? I had a guy take umbrage to that a few years ago. Some of you will remember. Spoke right out in church and called us on this. Why don't you give that money to families? We give this money to hundreds of families. Amen. But here's the thing about it. If there were no this, there would be no that. Do you know why the foreign missionaries are on the field? And I, I don't remember, but Sister Langle, do you happen to remember how many countries our missionaries are in that we support? Say again. 192 countries? I did not know that. We support missionaries in 192 countries. I was thinking it was about half that much. Wow. <coughs> Uh, the gospel would not be in 192 countries if churches like this one didn't give. We give. As a matter of fact, foreign missions alone last year, we gave over $93,000. That's right. But again, if there was no this, there would be no that. So, Vision Sunday is the day we promote this. We promote this church. Hallelujah. So this church can continue to give outside these walls. <clears throat> Amen. Uh, I need to make sure that everyone has a pledge card because that's what this is about. <clears throat> We're going to pledge. Amen. If you don't have a pledge card, if you'll raise your hand. If you don't have a pen, raise your hand. And the ushers will uh, run real quickly to where you are and give you a pledge card or a pen or whatever you need. All right. We want to be prepared when the time comes make our pledge. Just hold on to the card, please. Just hold on to it, don't move. When God was ready to make his home in the midst of his people, he gave Moses a blueprint for its construction. Every aspect of God's new residence was intended to foreshadow a truth that would be seen more clearly in the New Testament. From the stakes that were driven into the earth to hold the 
tent curtains in place in Moses' tabernacle to the silver foundations of the holy place and the holy of holies that foretold the price of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Every part of the tabernacle held meaning. So the people were not just giving to build furniture or to buy ropes or stakes or curtains. They were giving to prepare a place where God felt at home. A place where deity could dwell close to humanity. A place where his creation could feel near to the creator. In 2023, we still bring our offerings. We still construct places of worship where God can sit on a throne of praise. And by making him available to the hurting, the distressed, the outcast, the sorrowful, the destitute, the sinner, we are providing a place of safety where souls can have a life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ. So you see, our giving should be willing. It should not be reluctant. It should not be resistant. It should not be resentful. Exodus chapter 35, verse 21. And they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up, and everyone whom his spirit made willing. Let's all say willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation and for all his service and for all the holy garments. The children of Israel brought a willing offering. Let's all say willing. A willing offering unto the Lord. Every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work which the Lord commanded to be made by the hand of Moses. Mother Shepherd used to tell a story about a preacher's son named Reggie. Some of you will remember hearing this. Uh, his dad, who was the pastor, was receiving an offering during a service, and he watched as the ushers passed the offering plate around. Well, when the offering plate came to his son, Reggie, Reggie pulled out a dime, kissed it, and dropped it in the offering plate. Well, his father obviously was watching, and he immediately shut the service down, stopped the ushers, and he told them to take the plate back to Reggie. And he said, son, take that dime out of the offering plate. God doesn't want you to give anything that you don't give willingly. Well, <laughs> I hope we don't see anybody kissing their check before they <laughs> drop it in the offering plate. If we do, we're not going to chasten you in front of everybody but I'll try to catch you before you get out the door. <laughs> Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 says this, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, nor of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. Through the years, <clears throat> there have been some outliers on the periphery of the church who have been critical of uh, any church receiving an offering. Some of this animosity toward giving is likely the result of televangelists who have made appeals for causes that were less than worthy. Others might have a problem giving because of greed or because of fear or because of a, a lack of faith. But here at the Church of Columbus, we've preached this same message with the same integrity for 70 years. We preach the Word of God, and we practice what we preach. The Bible teaches us that if we sow, then we'll reap. That's why we preach giving. You know, it makes no sense for a farmer to assume a field that he owns, that he's plowed, that he's watered, will produce a crop if he doesn't put any seed in it. It makes no sense to assume that we can be recipients of God's blessing if we give God nothing to work with. Remember, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And again, 2 Corinthians 9, 6, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. If we sow sparingly, 
we'll reap sparingly. If we sow bountifully, we'll reap bountifully. <clears throat> In a few minutes, I mentioned this uh, a little bit sooner, um, I'm going to have a couple of folks that have some tremendous testimony. Um, let me review very quickly what we've done here in the past uh, year or so. As most of you know, God gave us instruction in February of 2021, two years ago this month, to open our balcony. <clears throat> so we began preparation for this by hiring an architectural firm. firm. As a matter of fact, Brother Mark Riles has been very, very uh, instrumental in making all of this happen. And he stayed right on, folks, uh, to ensure that it got done right. He's a very meticulous person, and uh, we benefited from that. <clears throat> we completely removed, of course, the, uh, the facade of the building and, and replaced all of that uh, as part of the work that overall work that we had done. Inside the sanctuary, our <clears throat> platform has been modified. We took down the modesty wall here at the choir. Uh, we expanded our steps to accommodate uh, weddings and opening access to the platform on, the, on each side so that folks can have easier access to it. Uh, <clears throat> the rear wall of the sanctuary was removed and construction began on opening our balcony, which added over 340 seats. When we first moved in to this facility in 2003, 20 years ago, April, we brought over around 200 folks with us. Within two years, that number had grown to 300. Within six years, we were averaging over 400. Amen. <clears throat> uh, what happened, Pastor? <clears throat> I've been asked that by other ministers. Two things primarily. Number one, uh, the military drawdown in the mid-teens we were running 400 to 450, and that knocked us all the way back down to about 300. We had a lot of families to leave in a very short amount of time. And then, of course, COVID hit. At the time, we were averaging around 300. One Sunday after COVID hit, I believe we had 134, if I'm not mistaken. 134. Thankfully, it quickly, you know, ratcheted back up. But even now, our average attendance, I believe, last month was 280. Is that what it was? Is that right? <laughs> 280. Um, but here's the thing about it. Say, so why did you open the balcony if you only run 280? <laughs> when you get to the Red Sea and God tells you to cross it, you don't look back at Pharaoh's army, you don't look at the deep blue waters. What you do is pack up the kids on the wagon and take off. And because we walk by faith and not by sight, and because we trust in the Lord every step of the way, that's all we knew how to do. So when God said, open the balcony, well, here we are. I don't know what God has got in mind, but he knows. And I'm following him. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. I'm just following Jesus. He's the one who told us to build this in the first place. Hallelujah. <clears throat> now, if you sit in the balcony, this is what is beneath the concrete under your seat. Those are metal risers. And <clears throat> they poured concrete on top of that. And then they put in the carpet and then the seats. <clears throat> Uh, here you see the back wall of the sanctuary before it was removed for the balcony. And this is obviously a photo of what happened to that back wall after we spent $2.2 million to take it down. Hallelujah. <laughs> there have been several folks uh, who have come in just visiting some ministers from out of town, actually. And... Uh, from everything I've heard, they were very, very impressed by this. And, you know, you get the impression after a while, because I've been around the block a time or two, that when you see what God is doing through someone else, it inspires you to walk on. And I don't know how many of you realize this or not, but even now, we are probably 
in the top five out of about 100 churches in terms of size, attendance. And when it comes to giving, foreign missions, last year, we were the number two church in the entire district. That's right. Uh, this next photo shows you the stage prior to the modesty wall being removed and the other changes that were made. The modesty wall is that right there. That wall that used to sit right here behind me. <clears throat> it's called the modesty wall because folks who sat in the choir, I guess it was modest to be behind the wall, you know. So <laughs> we had that taken down, though, <clears throat> and uh, that way the choir back and forth much, much easier access to those uh, to those risers. <clears throat> uh, Thirty-seven years ago, <clears throat> our five thousand square foot facility over on Norris Road uh, would seat a little over two hundred people. It sat on a small lot with only forty-five parking spaces and no room to expand. And we did look at trying to do that. The net worth of the church at the time was about $200,000. But today, thanks to the faithful stewardship of folks who believe that God is faithful to the faithful, we're here in this 33,000 square foot facility. It seats 800. It has parking for 260 vehicles. And the net worth is about $5 million. That's about 30 times from where we were. <clears throat> and somebody asked me three or four years ago, Pastor, what if the church went out of business? Would, uh, would you sell everything and distribute all the money to the members? <laughs> no, that would be against the law. <laughs> well, who would get it? In a case like that, the IRS requires you to give that money to another nonprofit. So... If anybody <clears throat> watching these televangelists get the wrong idea about this church, let me just tell you, there's no personal interest except for God interest in the leadership or the membership of this church. Now, we, have got, we don't have any plans to go out of business. We've been here for 70 years. If the Lord tarries, we'll be here another 70. If he doesn't, we'll go straight to heaven, and I don't care who gets this building. But in the meantime, we have been good stewards with the blessing of God. And that's the reason that after we pay this loan off, the net worth will probably go up to around $6 million. But that's the reason we only owe, what is it, one point? It's not 1.1 million. We've already paid, I think, 30 or 45,000 off of that. <clears throat> and Lord willing, before the end of this year, we'll pay another $100,000 off of that in addition to the monthly payment. You know, Harry Truman, Harry Truman, president after uh, President Roosevelt at the close of uh, World War II, he had a plaque on his desk that read, the buck stops here. Well, the buck stops here. So I'm super careful about how the bucks of this church are spent. And Lord willing, we're going to pay that loan off in five years. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Pastor Shepherd, how is all this possible? It is a testimony to the fact that we believe and live God is faithful to the faithful. Somebody say amen. Do you believe God is faithful to the faithful? Well, many of you have heard the personal testimony of my wife and I. I've given it so many times. God has been good to us. Uh, but when you have really good news, it's hard not to share it. Amen. But today we're going to hear from a couple of our members who also have their own testimony of the goodness of God. Both of these saints are faithful stewards who have proven that God is as good as his word. And their testimony is going to bless and inspire all of us. And we need, need to hear what God has done uh, in the lives of others. Uh, first of all, here in just a moment, I'm going to introduce him first. Where's Brother Alex? Come right on, Brother Alex. <clears throat> Most of you know, 
Alex is married to our youngest da daughter, Carla. And uh, one of the things that impressed me about Alex shortly after I met him, he, he, he has a big heart. He has big plans for his family. But from the time he first started here at the Church of Columbus, he has always put God first in his life. Uh, when the building inspector's office <coughs> last year informed us that we were going to have to install a fire suppression system, which we didn't know we were going to have to do, uh, the initial bids were almost $500,000. Uh, Alex <coughs> stepped in, and his company provided the water main coming up to the building that saved us several thousand dollars. <coughs> Amen. And it wasn't hard to get him to do it. He wanted to help. Uh, he repaired that sinkhole, some of you remember, that we had in the back parking lot uh, last year. There's another uh, low place, a depression, near the uh, building out here that he's going to be fixing in the next couple of weeks. And <coughs> that's not enough. He's going to be overseeing, or is overseeing, the construction of uh, a new home for his family on a lake out in Harris County, actually not very far from the Walkers. <coughs> Amen. And he's got a tremendous testimony about that he's going to share with us here uh, in just a minute. Uh, <clears throat> my wife and I are proud to call Alex our son-in-law, and I'm looking forward to him sharing this wonderful testimony. It will bless your heart. Come right on, brother. Praise the Lord, church. thank Pastor Shepard for uh, the opportunity to share this testimony, and I want to thank God for the test, which is the nourishment that grows our faith. So this theme this year is to magnify our Lord, so I brought my magnifying glass in hopes that I will be able to magnify our Lord through this testimony. So as Pastor just mentioned... Um, and some of you may or may not know, Carla and I are in the process of building our dream home. And I have to admit, that is a test in and of itself. During the framing process, the cost tripled. And we had contingency funds trying to be good stewards of what God has given to us, set aside for situations like this. However, uh, the added cost more than doubled what we had set aside. And I'm going to be completely honest. I was angry and hurt because the builder was a friend of mine and someone who I admire and look up to. I couldn't see past the problem and I lost a lot of sleep over it. I didn't know how to confront my friend and every time I thought about it, I just grew more angry. When I sit out there and I hear sermons about the Jews coming out of Egypt, and how they murmured after they had just witnessed the amazing miracles that God had performed. I think to myself, how could they? I would never forget. But this is exactly what I was doing in my situation. God has helped me numerous times before. And when I was cornered by life and had no way out except to trust him. Why should this situation be any different? Was he a sometimes God? No. So I decided to confront my friend in friendship and not in anger. On the way to the meeting, I prayed, as I had several times before, to ask God to work in the situation. As I was finishing my prayer, I looked up to the sky, and I saw two clouds part with a single rainbow in between them. It was in this moment that I understood that God had always been in the situation and had handled it from the beginning. You know, when we feel wronged by another person, we selfishly want God to take our side and punish the other person. But he loves that other person just as much as he loves us. And as any good father wants his children to love one another. It's in this spirit that I went into the meeting. And before I could say anything, my friend started off the meeting explaining how he knew how much this added cost was affecting me. So he offered to not receive another fee for the remainder of the project, which was the same amount 
that the project was over budget. Praise God. You know, God was working in the heart of my friend at the same time he was working in my heart. And our friendship is still intact because of that. So I want to finish and leave you with a couple thoughts. Be careful not to murmur. If God has brought you through a trial before, he will do it again. And if there is any conflict between you and a brother and sister of Christ, know that God loves you both equally. And he desires you to love one another regardless of the hurt. Praise the Lord. There's no shadow that has ever overcome your life. And there is no rival that could ever stand against your mind. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won, we've already won. no weapon that has ever left a mark on you. There is no army with the power to conquer truth. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won, you've already
God. Feel the presence of the Lord in this place. This is the kind of environment that miracles occur in. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Brother Frederick, God doesn't just give financial blessing, He heals cancer. We've seen Him do it right here. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. And Alex didn't tell you how much in dollars that that saved. And I, I'm not sure if I got this number right, but I think it was at least $30,000. That's not a little blessing. That's a big blessing. Well, glory to God. God bless you. You may be seated. Sister Davia Adams, <clears throat> I'm sorry, 90,000, I got, God doesn't deal in such little numbers, <laughs> sorry about that, $90,000, well you know what, we're about to hear another miracle, it happened just this last year, and uh, this, this one also is going to bless your heart, Sister Davia has a tremendous testimony of God's goodness. This is a lady of amazing faith. She's a great inspiration to everyone around her. And she's been a blessing to the Church of Columbus ever since she walked through the door. Her testimony is going to inspire, encourage, and challenge our faith. Sister Davia, come right on and share your testimony. Praise the Lord. I want to thank the Lord and Pastor Shepherd for allowing me this time to share this testimony. I pray my testimony will give our Lord the glory he is due as I magnify our miraculous and faithful God. First, I want to say this is not about money. It's the vehicle. Money is the vehicle God chose in which to express himself. Today, I hope you hear that I am speaking about faith. My testimony, I believe, <clears throat> goes back to a Bible study I had one morning in early January of 2022. I read in the book of Mark, chapter 6, 5 through 6, and he could do there no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. And I was cut to the heart and saddened, and I wondered what the Lord meant by the mighty works that could not be done. So I began to pray earnestly and daily for God to show me mighty miracles. I asked the Lord to make me a vessel whereby he could work mighty miracles. When vision service came around last year, we were still holding services in the gym. And pastor asked us to pray about our pledges. I heard the still small voice, y'all, say, pledge $100,000. Yeah, yeah, did your heart almost stop? Because mine did. But the things the Lord had already shown me and the prayers that I was praying encouraged me to pledge what I heard the Lord speak. I sought counsel with Sister Richards, <laughs> and she blinked. But to her credit, she just said, okay, praise the Lord. Let's run this by pastor. And I have to say thank God for her. Because I've seen over and over again how she will not quench the spirit of God. When he's moving, she's committed to let God move. And so I went to pastor and I shared my story. And he told me of another great woman who had great faith and was used mightily by God. And I was so encouraged and assured because he said, it's going to be a blessing, sister, whether you fulfill the pledge in full, partial, or just $500 because that's his heart. During this time, 
I was going through the process of buying a new home, and I was preparing my old house to sell. However, I'd only been in my house for nine years, and I did not expect to make a significant return on selling it. To my surprise, my realtor set the selling price over $30,000 than what I was thinking I could get. The moment the house hit the market, the appointments turned into an open house. It was like a fire had started. And suddenly a bidding war started. People bid the house over $20,000 more than the $30,000 that I had thought was ridiculous. And then, praise God, they wanted to take the home as is. They said, I don't care if it doesn't pass inspection. I just want the house. I will pay all closing costs. It was unbelievable. The house sold so fast. I thank God for Sister Lisa Johnson. I thank God for Sister Grace Ashmalash because they were a blessing in getting all the boxes moved and getting me out of that house. And when the numbers were crunched, the actual disclosure statement was sent to me. I was looking at a check for over $94,000. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Unbelievable. Only God could do this. I was in shock. Not only had God made sure that all my needs for the new home was met to get us in that house, I was somehow debt free from moving. I, no, I didn't spend the 94000 from moving into the house. I was debt free. And I was about to receive the check for most of my vision pledge. <laughs> Praise the Lord for his word. I believe the house brought such a tremendous return because of faithfulness to prayer and God's willingness to answer those prayers and increase my faith. When I actually transferred the check into my account, I had to remember Ananias and Sapphira because temptation came. There were all kinds of thoughts that came up when that miracle became a real check. But God be his glory, because he was faithful to me. How could I possibly show myself to be unfaithful to a faithful God? He is Jehovah Jireh. He is our provider. He brought, now listen to this. He brought this miracle through a single lady with no job. God, to God be a glory. And I know that this testimony isn't complete yet. As I continue and we continue to magnify the Lord, he is going to show us that it's impossible to outgive him, for he is faithful. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you. What can you say? God is good. Mm. Well, hallelujah. <clears throat> Wasn't that incredible? My, what a wonderful and uplifting and challenging testimony. Amen. Tell you what, let's give a hand clap of appreciation to Sister Davy and Brother Alex again, shall we? My, what great faith. What a great example for the rest of us. Did you folks hear what they said? $90,000 and then... $100,000? Wow. God is good. Well, this year, <clears throat> our goal is $400,000. Can we raise $400,000? Let me ask that again. Can we raise $400,000? I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Hallelujah. In the late 1980s and early 1900s, uh, we began to emphasize the importance of sowing our tithes and offerings into the kingdom of God in order to reap a harvest of God's blessing. Now, this I want you to hear. As a result... Over a 10-year period, from the late uh, eight, uh, 1980s 
to the late 1990s, over a 10-year period. Everybody listening? The average income of the families of this church increased by 400%. Okay, if you're having trouble with percentages, let me say it another way. In 1989, if a family was earning around $15,000, 10 years later they were earning about $60,000. Did the income of the church go up? Absolutely. Why? Because they were faithful. They were faithful to God, and God was faithful to them. I'm telling you, God is faithful to the faithful. So well, I'm having trouble believing that. Well, I honestly, God bless you. No offense intended. I feel sorry for you. I really do. <clears throat> because I have proven God is faithful to the faithful. These two testimonies have proven God is faithful to the faithful. How many verses of Scripture do we need to hear? How many sermons on giving is it going to take? How many personal testimony of the blessing of God upon others must we hear to inspire us before we're motivated to begin trusting God on our own, for our own blessing, for our own victories, for our own testimony? When will we begin planting the seed to produce our own crop, to reap our own harvest? As someone who's proven God to be as good as his word, I encourage you, put your trust in him now. Pledge your faith, not your fear. Pledge your faith, not your fear. Pledge your faith, not your fear. Sister Davia pledged her faith. Her fear tried to talk her out of it, but she didn't pledge her fear. She pledged her faith. Pledge your faith, not your fear. If you will, look at your pledge card now. <clears throat> There's some pertinent information that you'll need to fill out at the bottom, your name, address, and so forth, so that we can send you a receipt for your contribution. <clears throat> but just above that, you will notice that there are uh, two columns, one for weekly and one for monthly contributions. And you will determine whether or not you want to give your pledge weekly or monthly, and then you'll mark how much under that column, weekly or monthly. You want to give... Uh, $10,000 a week, $100,000 a month. Just make sure you get it in the right column so you don't get a receipt for, or a, a done, $5 million at the end of the year. All right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Don't look at the size of the enemy. Look at the size of your God. Hallelujah. Now we're going to pray. <clears throat> the choir is going to come and sing. And we're going to pledge. How many feel better now than when you came in today? <clears throat> How many feel like your faith has been increased some while you've been here? Anybody? Anybody? <clears throat> if you feel like your faith has been increased while you've been here, let's clap our hands to the Lord a little bit, shall we? <clears throat> Hallelujah. The Bible said you're made overcomers by the word of your testimony and the blood of the Lamb. This is the kind of testimony that helps you overcome. So that no matter what Satan throws in your path, you just look up and say, oh, magnify the Lord with me. My God's bigger than that. No matter what Satan puts in your path, my God's bigger than that. The Red Sea, my God's bigger than that. Pharaoh's army, my God's bigger than that. Bitter water, my God's bigger than that. You need meat and you need bread, my God's bigger than that. You need to pay your bills this month, my God's bigger than that. Hallelujah. You need a job, my God's bigger than that. He can move on anybody in any company to give you a job. And if you're in business for yourself, he'll move on folks that need work to pick up and call your number. Hallelujah. How do you know, Pastor? Come on now. I've been living it for 68 years. That's how I know. You've heard testimony. That's how I know. I would love for some of you folks to have testimonies like this next year at our vision service. I would love to spend the whole service 
hearing testimonies just like this. And we can if we'll pledge our faith and not our fear. Everybody say amen. Let's pray together, shall we? Precious Jesus, you've taught us that faith the size of a grain of mustard seed can move mountains. Lord, we found that lesson to be true. Time and time again, Lord, you've moved mountains that seemed immovable. Now, Lord, I pray that you would bolster the faith of this wonderful church family as we continue to put our trust in you. Drop a word of promise and reassurance into our hearts. Let each of us know that you will do through us in 2023 whatever needs to be done to magnify, to glorify, to lift up, to praise your great name. Inspire our faith, Lord. Prove our faith. Reward our faith as we pledge our faith and not our fear. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. God bless you. Yeah.
challenges that we have in our walk with Christ. In time, the Lord challenges us to make us better, to help us grow. Amen? So we can look back and have a testimony because we've been obedient to His Word. His favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children.